Welcome back everyone. It's time for a second panel discussion on overcoming the edtech challenges. For this panel, I would like to invite the founder of Blink Invest, Mr. Amit Ratanpal. Handling entrepreneurship and marketing strategy at Base Business School, Mr. Mike Southern. Hello, good morning. Harappa Education, Ms. Shreyasi Singh, and the Managing Director at, of San Academy Group of Schools, Ms. Acharya. Archana. And finally, our moderator for the panel, the advisor, EdTech and Entrepreneurship, and Entrepreneur in the presence of UNCEF, Mr. Manish Upadhyay. Mr. Upadhyay, over to you, and welcome all the panelists. Uh, thanks, Abhinav, and uh, I once again welcome all, all our panelists. Uh, uh, before we begin, uh, I think the format of uh, today's session would be, uh, uh, I would like to keep it very, very informal. And uh, uh, people should be comfortable talking about the, the area they are comfortable in. I will just lay down the subject area that we're going to talk about. Uh, I would request all panelists to spend not more than three to four minutes you know, per round so that everyone gets opportunity to speak and we can cover more ground during this one hour of discussion. So, the, the topic itself is you know, huge in terms of the, it's very broad, overcoming at, at tech challenges, and there are multiple aspects to it. One of the areas that we are uh, going to delve deeper into with some of the panelists would be uh, the multiple economic levels, you know, which is tier one, two, three, and what it takes to create product and go to market strategy. With Mike coming in, I would like to push Mike towards a slightly more international perspective where we can talk about developed country versus developing country versus underdeveloped country and you know whenever we talk about multiple tiers you can take that as your tiers of discussion because then this will throw very interesting insight about how to create product for international audience uh without further ado i would request uh, uh in the first round to introduce yourself uh one minute quick introduction and uh we can begin with uh, uh you know anyone any order so amit you can go fast maybe. Uh, thanks, Manish. Uh, good to see you after a long time. Uh, my quick uh, background is uh, I'm a chartered accountant and I'm in this uh, Harvard Business School. I started my career with Billards for Life and then moved to ICL Bank. So first 10 years has been in financial services. And my key strength has always been building businesses. And that's where I moved out and created India's first private equity fund, which only invests in the education sector. And since last 10 years, I've been investing in two sectors, this education and financial services. Uh, some of my notable investments includes Imarticus Learning, you know, which is into skills for financial services and analytics or Eduvans, uh, which we exited also. Uh, Blink Invest, as we speak today, is, is a 100 crore fund which invests into edtech and fintech sector. Uh, and within the education uh, sector, we, we like the space of early childhood education. We have recently released a report on that. We like K-12, specifically on curriculum and school management. And from a higher education, we like the space like so, uh, you know, skill education, uh, credit for large universities. And as we know, everything is moving towards digitization. We believe that ERP and, and the end-to-end -end solutions uh, for all the universities, colleges, and schools to work more effectively, a good solution, technology solution, will also be a good uh, opportunity for us to look at it. Great, thanks, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you, and first, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm in London, so welcome from uh, slightly cold London this morning. Um, as you can see, I'm very old. I've been an entrepreneur for 40 years, and the first company I co-founded was a technology training company building the building the internet essentially before the internet was built. So I've had lots of adventures over the way, and I find myself. At Bayes Business School, which used to be called Cass Business School, part of City University of London, teaching a very large group, over 500 students in entrepreneurship first and then marketing strategy. So that's me. Oh, and uh, in the meantime, in 2002, I co-authored this marvellous book, The Beer Mat Entrepreneur, uh, which is one of the best-selling books in the world, I'm pleased to say, on entrepreneurship. And one of the previous speakers talked about writing on a napkin. That works as well. We write on a beer mat in a British pub. So... Uh, I, I'm an educator now, but um, fascinated by education technology, and that's why I'm here. Superb. Welcome, welcome to India and to this panel. Yeah, Shreyasi, over to you. Hi. Uh, 
Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, great to see you, Amit, and thanks, Manish, for having me. Um, hi, Mike and Archana as well. Um, I'm one of the founders of Harappa Learning. Uh, Harappa and the company CEO. Essentially, we focus on what we call our thrive skills or cognitive, social, and behavioral skills for lifelong learning. We essentially, through our work curriculum and program on cognitive, social, and behavioral skills, reach learners from the age of 18 to 45 through either selling to universities in India. Um, uh, large part to enterprises in India and obviously to individual self-sponsored learners um, in this age group. Um, before being an entrepreneur and an education entrepreneur, I've had a full um, career as a as a journalist and uh, as an author. Mike, I don't have my book next to me, but I've written a couple as well. <laughs> so, yeah, so the entrepreneurship, um, uh, each for me has is sort of a second career in in my middle age just to uh just to match up mike's old age comment right. <laughs> great thanks thanks uh Shresi. welcome uh over to you Acha. uh hello manish uh thank you for inviting me and it's amazing to share the stage with amit mike and shreyanti i think it's going to be a very a good brainstorming session uh to talk about me i'm archana so i'm based out of chennai uh, I'm the founder of the San Academy Group of Schools. It is a chain of CBSE schools. Uh, so I did my computer science engineering in Chennai. And uh, like any 21, 22 year old, I wanted to open a play school for children, you know, because I was really young, you know, I wanted to be around children. I want to open a play school for children. And uh, that's how it just started. So once I completed engineering, I went to work for a school for about a year and founded my own school. Uh, thinking that I would do a chain of preschools. Uh, but uh, parents and students were very comfortable and they refused to move out. And then they kind of motivated me to, you know, start the primary wing and uh, slowly, no looking back. Now we are a group of schools with four branches and more than 5,000 students and 500 staff. And uh, we are also looking to expand in tier two and tier three areas now. So uh, Great. that's all about uh, me. Wonderful. Uh so as uh, the audience can see it's a very very interesting panel you know uh, yeah. we try to cover all people from multiple background but uh, uh, you know the topic itself is very huge i will begin with the first round uh, of our conversation which is about uh, uh, you know various economic levels and how we uh, look at them from an ethic perspective so my favorite definition which i might have uh, explained earlier in earlier panels also are divided into four levels. Uh, so level one, I call people with multiple devices. You know, they have access to laptop, smartphone, everything on the earth, you know, iPad, everything. That's a level one economic level from an ethic perspective. Level two, I'm saying smartphone with very good internet connection. That becomes level two audience. Level three is smartphone with intermittent internet connection and maybe intermittent electricity you know, in India. And and level four would be non non-smartphone economic levels you know? and the reason i've brought these four economic levels is when we look at and dissect this segment of multiple tiers you know in india as well as across the globe these are the four levels we hit upon when it comes to ed tech and delivery of ed tech and my first question is to shesi which is uh shesi you've created product for corporates you have now taken it to higher education and uh, obviously you're planning to go deeper into tier uh, one two three cities uh uh, what is it that one should focus on, you know, and talking from your example, from the product perspective. So I think first round, we'll just focus on the product side of it. Second round on go to market. So from the product perspective, what are the things that you've kept in mind while creating a product that works across multiple dimensions? So I think uh, that's a very useful classification of the audience, uh, the way you've been from an access perspective, uh, obviously, no ed tech can really meaningfully touch category four. So I don't think yeah. we can pretend that we're um, reaching them at all. Um, I think even category three, um, you know, without the right devices, without the right internet connection, obviously is, um, isn't something that any of us are being able to reach. I think most of ed tech, at least now, 
um, in India is at the category one and category two. Um, and, you know, if you could remind me what your category two definition was. Um, but I think a lot of, the, I mean, we've seen over the last two years with students going back um, you know, to hometowns and sort of intermittent and erratic internet connections, um, you know, and non-laptop, but on the phone internet connections um, uh, from a device perspective. We've started thinking a lot about from a product, you know, because we create a Harappa, unlike being an aggregator in a marketplace, we create all our content ourselves. And, you know, we saw usage happen so much, especially from our higher education um, uh, business, right, where all the students were, that they were all consuming everything on the mobile so we're doing a lot more on vertical mm -hmm. videos uh, in terms of even at the at the time of shooting because of course you know your site is mobile responsive but it's it still essentially was desktop optimized uh, and optimized for a horizontal screen so from a production perspective um what you do on uh from uh you know start shooting on vertical is something we're really focusing on especially for a b2c learners or the self-sponsored learners um we're actually moving the moving the learning journeys almost totally to the app because we saw that more than 90 percent of the people were really consuming the content um, on mobile the second really interesting um, discovery we had from a learning analytics and learner behavior perspective was while our curriculum while our self-paced of course we have lied because we have blended learning journeys and programs on a self-paced um, curriculum we were really surprised to find out that a lot of people were consuming it almost as audio content um, right. And um, uh, even though the it was designed to be VO text plus graphics and a lot of the content was coming, but really in low Internet zones, um, it was great for it to be consumed as an audio only content. And that's again, that's something now we're switching off. And in fact, one of the research that we're doing internally to say, hey, can we only create audio only live sessions as well because the other thing that we were saying is there was so much zoom and video fatigue that even when we were doing even in enterprises with senior people we were doing programs you know the faculty saw a uh, cohort of 60 people all videos off and all you're staring into is black ties which is neither great for our faculty's motivation or energy you're getting back and you know you're unnecessarily wasting so much streaming space for that so we're trying to experiment on a lot of audio formats and i feel audio is still we're still scratching the surface um on what audio can mean for learning especially in professional learning and lifelong learning where it is you know beyond the curriculum as a busy professional so those two things shooting in the vertical format for the mobile really moving everything to mobile for the self-sponsored learners very interestingly we saw all our enterprise learners i mean they in fact probably have all the best smartphones available but they would prefer to learn on the on on the desktop and you know more than 70 percent of the learning was still happening on the desktop but somehow anybody who's buying it from themselves was consuming mm -hmm. it from, uh, consuming it on the app and needed that and second is this audio i think from a product perspective um these are the yeah. two um big things that we're trying to innovate on uh, for this with students and the last thing I'll say and I'll stop is with um, with students in universities as they went back to uh, you know their hometowns and in a were in a very different environment where it was really difficult to even get them into the mind space to start learning it you know you're sort of back in your childhood homes where you know you're just part of that neighborhood's milieu again and not in what where you know in a campus i think whatsapp has worked really well and i think whatsapp uh, for learning um, yeah. is such a i mean that's the one that that's it's the most resilient tool um uh, in terms of the internet right uh, and in india often you know sometimes you have better connection on whatsapp than even for yeah. college and we found from a nudging perspective because which is one of the things that we think we do really well at Harappa is nudge progress and nudge people towards adoption a lot we found great success in using whatsapp as a tool and the whatsapp chat groups that we've created and almost drip feed like a guided reflection question every mm. morning so at mm. least from a you know um, yeah. sort of some application habit creation and just a prompted reflection we found um, whatsapp to be a really easy sustainable um, efficient oh, very interesting so shesi uh, in our previous cohort we had a <clears throat> company isaac which is whatsapp based management learning management system completely whatsapp first you know, and uh, kind of a system. So I'd be seeing that those kind of organizations coming. Uh, also on your point about audio only, 
the recent clubhouse phenomena uh, is a is a uh, great phenomenon that is happening and this has potential to go to level 4 which is non smartphone user so that's where we are you know i also see a lot of innovations might come in because that's a huge audience again which is not being touched and audio can be a great level amit uh, uh, by the way i just one quick yeah. point the, by the way the way t- traffic has bounced back to being worse than pre normal in all the cities so we've got you know again we were not used to it and now we're all getting used to it again i feel again audio learning as a professional learning and that time spent which of the two years we didn't think about that time yeah Uh, spend it all on what learners are doing. I think again we're starting to think about hey, what can I do at five thirty six p.m. Can I trigger a ten minute little audio uh, module uh, yeah, for someone yeah. to go? Sure, sure. So, so Amit, again, uh, uh, similar type of question, but because you meet so many organizations, you look at so many startups, you look at so many innovative products, which are any examples or any thought that come to your mind when we look at just multiple economic level an organization or a startup that has to handle product across multiple levels and anything interesting that you have seen that you want to talk about no uh anish i think uh, india as as you know is is a very large country and all of us know with every 100 kilometers right from dialect to food everything changes so one thing i would look at it that probably Uh, in india specifically the education sector as we see is becoming mature day by day mm-hmm. and there are audiences been available for different segments and different uh, locations and different areas as well so i think first of all we have to look at india as as it's it's one country but i think we have to really divide this into various different segments and and every area and i can give you a few examples where the segmentation will play an important role so if if you look at in uh, about couple of years back when we invested into let's say company like amarticus learning or mm-hmm. even to extend our brand you know some of these companies uh, they were mainly focusing on courses where the fees were 1 lakh 2 lakhs uh, you know lakh number fees they were focusing on english they were focusing on the top 5 to 10 cities and and you know that's where they were getting most of this uh, students from but now as we see uh you know everyone is focusing on on, on the technology companies want to reduce cost right they want to move into you know and look at to a larger audience because india is again becoming a very large hub for digitization all of them have started going to tier 3 tier 4 tier 5 cities yeah. uh including engineering colleges at the same time what they realize that it's it's okay if someone don't know how to speak english even you can do a coding in in you know vernacular mm-hmm. language even if you know yeah. because coding itself is a language by itself so you need to know how good you can code code now whether it's a full stack development or analytics and that's where we are seeing companies now a going for lower price point uh, because what they need to do is a specific course which they want to learn and that's what they want to focus on and not necessarily it's in english it can be even a vernacular language yeah. and everything is really picking up or we take an example of byju byju if you really look at the price point at which they are focusing on is still i would say uh, high end relatively uh, in india we still have large masses there are schools which is running into lakhs of schools where the school fees are between 20000 rupees per annum to 50000 rupees per annum now that is a very very large mass opportunity available yeah. now they need tutoring they will need test preparation not only that that but even the school will need better infrastructure and even need to be equipped to be you know uh with the new uh, digitization wave and and you know content and everything so that's again a very different segment to look at it so i believe or we believe at bling that uh in india we need to come out with different products different segmentation and and different approaches to solve a problem uh, yeah. again if we look at uh you know uh you know companies like let's say take an example like doubtnut right it's it's a it's a problem solving uh you know for for masses is not something if someone want to do a very specific that they will obviously either go for tutoring services or including one to one or one to many as well so that's where we are seeing uh, one has to really look at, at uh, india and the key i think out here is is customer acquisition because yes we know that there is a very large audience available for all of us to cater to how do you acquire and come out yeah. with that specific solution which helps that particular segment at the lowest possible cost But the unit economics. Yeah, 
Yeah. That's where I think most of the startup initially went for acquisition of students or acquisition of schools or whatever that you know uh, metrics be without looking at the revenue stream. But now we are seeing that yes, while we are acquiring a, a segment, let's start looking at your revenue stream. Let's start looking at your unit economics as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's I think the shift which we are being seeing as we speak. Great, great. No, in fact, uh, to your point, it's very heartening to see that for the first time, Hindi channels education channels on youtube are getting maximum traction versus you know any including if you take english or any other language and more and more regional players are coming you know even i would say youtube is becoming a great source of uh, uh, income for a lot of tutors and educators who really teach well but they teach well in their vernacular language and i think for the first time in india i'm seeing this uh, uh, you know uh, the kind of money that a tutor is making, uh, which justifies the background that they come from, and teachers are getting their due after a long time. You know, in fact, in companies like Baiju's and others, you know, they they have huge pay packages. Uh, teachers, you know, the master trainers are getting that. So I think that's a very good sign. And the fact that we are breaking this English barrier, you know, English, which was preserved as a uh, people who, who who were looked up to can speak in English and vernacular was not getting due also started getting due. Uh, when it comes to English now, let's move to Mike, you know, and, and touch upon uh, uh, the international perspective. So Mike, you, you have a uh, wonderful background career in entrepreneurship, research, training, and you meet so many entrepreneurs. Now, if you, if there are any examples or even if there are no examples, you know, well, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll give you a best example of a great entrepreneur, young entrepreneur that I met. Recently. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you can, yeah. Sorry, just I will just complete my point, and then you can pigeon. And oh, if you can just touch upon, like I mentioned earlier, products. When an entrepreneur comes in and he's mm -hmm. creating a product for international market, especially looking at developing country, developed country, underdeveloped country as a whole. Uh, any any thoughts, anything that you have come across, any model that you propose in your uh, entrepreneurship training over to you, Mike. Absolutely. Well, you see, I find myself teaching entrepreneurship at an undergraduate level in one of the world's top business schools. Mm -hmm. So that's my audience. And there was one gentleman, the first gentleman this year who signed up with me on LinkedIn. I thought, mm -hmm. well, here's an young man, is a gentleman called Varenya Gupta. And so I met him for a coffee and I said, So, um, what about your parents? They work for the government. What do they do? And that turned out, to, his father turned out to be be Manish, Manish from uh, you in Incept. So that's how I come to be here. So mm -hmm. here I am in, in a lecture theatre with a large number of students. And my job is to produce a good show to get the material over. And I bring in guests every week and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID, uh, maybe there's 100 people watching remotely. So I thought, well, why isn't it 100,000? It's very yeah. straightforward. I can turn what I do into like a television show that anybody could watch for entertainment and information, and that could just be broadcast anyway. So there, there we start. Uh, but then you can take this as far as you like using education technology, which is all the things you've been talking about, converting the material that I have on entrepreneurship, which is of universal interest. Everybody wants to start a business, whether they want to be self-employed. Some of my students I know are going to be billionaires one day, and I tell them, make sure you solve the problems of the world while you're there, like hunger and poverty, and they, they promise me they will do that. So really it's a call out to the education technology industry from me saying, look, I've got a perfect place to prototype material, which works in a classroom environment, of course, because that's that's my job, but then can be converted to every other level. So some child in India could be watching this material, which is suitable for school children. So I'm sure uh, others will talk about that. This is really basic material, how you can bootstrap a company with no money, you can generate a bit of revenue, then maybe you can start a company like I did with your friends and sell that for lots of money, then then you can do anything you like in the world. So I've been asked by the university to look at joint venture partners in India, because I said, I'm doing this, who can help me put this stuff together? We can prototype it in the autumn, because I've got another four students coming in, then we can develop it for every tier you could possibly want. It's not for me to tell the education technologists how to run their businesses, uh, I've met lots of technologists, they're all brilliant people, and they will tell me how it works in different environments. And I'm particularly interested uh, in education technology platforms that use artificial intelligence, which work out 
when children interact with it, how they learn and then how best to deliver material to them. So see, I'm on a mission to make the world more enterprising. That could be being self-employed, it could be starting a company, it could be being entrepreneurial in a large organization, because uh, I teach that as well, in a, in a bank or a university, how to bring around change in an enterprising way to generate income and make the world a better place. So as I've told my students, if you're going to do a startup now, a proper startup that's going to grow and so on, there's no point doing it unless you have an objective to bring a billion dollar valuation in five years. Google did it, Uber did it, you know, some of them don't have much revenue, Amazon have done it. So that's what I'm, that's why I'm here today. It's to ask you how you can help me develop this material and let's prototype it in India. I mean, what better place? And then different languages, you're talking about local dialects. People can just run with the baton after that. that that's, that's my pitch really for today. Sure, sure. So we'll come back uh, uh, and uh, I will just uh, uh, request you to think about also the questions that I asked, you know, about multiple country and uh, designing for multiple countries. But uh, sure. Archana is back. I think uh, uh, Archana, uh, you, you, your segment of schools, you know, they've seen maximum disruption during COVID time. You know, and you've been one of the users of EdTech. And I think uh, if I may say so, EdTech has saved the day even partially, you know, for, for schools and even for universities. Uh, so what are the challenges, you know, you, you saw when, uh, uh, during COVID times related to ed tech and, uh, uh, and the challenge that still remain, because I think schools are still being opened in a hybrid way. Uh, so <coughs> we can just talk about the challenges from school perspective, learnings during the COVID time. And, uh, and uh, I would like to relate it to the product with Shreyasi, but I think let's begin with your thoughts. On that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I will speak about the challenges and also relate to the product. Uh, I feel from a school perspective, uh, the major challenge was training the faculty to handle the online platform. Hmm. Because uh, till then, uh, the use of resource materials would have been very limited, probably from a YouTube or, you know, it was not completely an ed tech platform. So in such a short span of time, to actually e well equip the teacher to take on the online tools was a great challenge. Uh, and I think uh, our teachers also really uh, cooperated to because, you know, it's I always think like as children, that's why they say like, you know, you can mold anyone when they are young, you know, as children, they are more open to new challenges and more open because the fear is not there. But once, you know, uh, you get too rigid as an adult, you know, you don't want to, you know, much open to new ideas and innovation and all of that. So that was the major challenge. Uh, but after the technology has been introduced into schools, mm -hmm. I'm sure I think the way forward is only a hybrid model. Because I think uh, as an educationist and also the faculties, they've come to understand the advantages that the edtech platform uh, can provide as a whole for the teacher, for the students. Because in the long run, it's a win-win situation for everybody. There are a lot of, uh, you know, it's very hassle-free. Uh, be it the corrections or, you know, mm -hmm. even pulling small, small reports from a school perspective, you know, like probably like taking attendance or, uh, you know, generating marks or, you know, the small, small things that you do uh, now when it is all digitized and when it's in a ed tech platform, uh, the teacher is also finding it uh, more comfortable. Yeah. So coming back to the product approach, I have a feeling like uh, any product, I think it should have an agile approach. So you have to build a product, you have to test it. And then you also have to take feedback. You know, these three are very, very important for any product. Now, we need to, uh, the question is, you know, product that is to be built for all economic uh, backgrounds. So, for example, a tier one, a digital marketing could work, you know, to uh, market the product or even to take feedback, right? There are a lot of review in online uh, sessions. But uh, when you come to a tier two or a tier three, I think, Still, we need to hire representatives. We need to have proper distributors, proper vendors, and all of that. Earlier, mass communication was there, like magazines, print media, and TV. But I think now, even a tier two and tier three is looking at a more personalized mode of communication. So we need to uh, capitalize that. And very, very important factor is the device compatibility. So any product that you, uh, you know, create should ensure that the device compatibility is there and the bandwidth com uh, the bandwidth consumption optimization is also a very major factor because uh, we know how it is in villages and in small towns you know the internet facility might not be as good as 
the cities that we have in India. So mm-hmm. I think if you want to grow big, if you want your product to reach a majority group of people, then you have to ensure that the quality of the bandwidth and your device compatibility is something you work on from day one. So that is one thing I want to add on. And uh, also, I think with the introduction of NEP, I think the best thing, I think all of you have rightly pointed out, the best thing about NEP is now we're also introducing the national education policy that they are coming up, the Indian government. They've also introduced the vernacular mode of teaching, at least yeah. till grade two, right? Because uh, I think all of us, you know, we all think uh, knowing English is like the top priority, at least in India, you know, that it, it's changing. But uh, I think knowledge can be driven and given in any language. So as young children, I think anything that you reach to a vernacular language will have a better perspective mm. and better outcome. So I think any product, if you really want to reach tier two and tier three, and then you have to focus on the vernacular part of it also, at least as far as India is concerned. So and these and are the, the I want to put across. Archana, any product beyond Zoom and Google Meet that you have used during pandemic time, any other edtech product? Or these okay. are the largely when it comes to an platform. online uh, yeah. platform, we did only Google and uh, mm. we did only uh, Zoom and all of that. Yeah. But we did use small, small tools like Kahoot, ThinkLink, mm. uh, okay. Fliptrick, Prezi. So mm. we used all these, you know, because uh, I think gamification is very important. It's the need of the day. So uh, just the teacher talking without even having the direct physical interaction it's not going to work as far as an online platform is concerned. So though our platform was basically, you know, Google and uh, Microsoft Teams and all of that, but we did engage in these kind of tools. Yes. And, and, you know, just a follow up on that. So if you look from a perspective of a school that is now you know, in a hybrid, oh. let's, let's talk about school opens now. So the moment school opens, there is very little time left with kids outside school to do stuff you know, online. Any plans that you have, top level, any type, any product that you are looking at that you wish to deploy during school hours for effectiveness? Anything yes. Uh, that's yeah. yes, it's a. Uh, uh, I do not know whether we are really going to implement during school hours, but these are things that we would like to continue. For example, mm-hmm. uh, we have no plans of closing down GCR. We want to continue with that. The reason being. Uh, like as I told uh, told you, like the online tools like Kahoot or Flipgrid yeah. or Prezi or whatever we were using, we still want that as a extended learning activity for the children. Though the teacher engages the student with whatever material and resources, you know, uh, to get an idea of what the t- child has understood, you know, so these kind of tools really help. So we want to continue with sure. that. That's point number one. And the other thing that uh, we'd like to continue uh, doing, you know, though we are in a hybrid model, you know, we always want to continue doing is uh, we uh, had two modes of learning. One is through the online platform. And the other thing, we made teachers make videos of every chapter. Mm -hmm. And it was uploaded in our own YouTube channel. So we have our YouTube channel and it was uploaded. We want to continue doing that because it's really very good because if the child does not understand a concept, then can go back. Yeah. And any child is absent, then they can still go back. So these yeah. are the two things which we would like to continue sure. doing. Great. Uh, so I will now shift focus towards GTM, go-to-market strategy. You know, uh, and uh, again, I have my four levels there. You know, which is uh, uh, I'll just lay. I'm just doing these levels so that you know, there is some context to a discussion. So when I look at startups, you know, level one, I put startups which have brute arrogant money. So they go after all media channels, including TVs of the world to IPLs and tournaments. Level two would be people with decent money and they have digital channel plus telecalling team with them. So maybe Shreshi, you sit there. Uh, level three is where there is some money, very little money, and they, they rely on partnerships a lot. So limited mm-hmm. digital spend, limited telecalling team, and relying on partnership. And level four is no money, no digital only partnership. So this is how I look at when I look at go to market strategy and you know, because a lot of things would emanate out of it, the resources uh, are aligned according to this and this entire approach of B2C versus B2B versus B2B2C that uh, B2B2C seems to be very favorite one emerging uh, during COVID time. Uh, uh, 
seems to be the model that uh, people are talking about. Now, Shreyasi, any learning again, coming back to you from the GTM front, any particular strategy, go-to-market strategy that has worked for you, that has cut across multiple levels, uh, any interesting uh, thing that has worked and, and also failures, if you can highlight that failures that you failed big time on, on go-to-market strategy. Uh, let me begin with the failures because, you know, they <laughs> stick more in your heads. <laughs> um, so one big, um, one big discovery for us over the last two years is, um, is we have not found success in B2B to B2C. Especially we have not found success in B2B to B2C where younger learners have to pay. And in Harappa's context, younger learners are... 18 to 24 and 18 to 24 25 right so we've tried many things virtual internships um even you know getting the colleges on board and then trying to sell to the students in a b2b to b2c manner um so we just have it and maybe it's the kind of curriculum i do feel like you know the kind of curriculum that harappa has um you need to get to a certain stage to understand whether maybe there's uh, uh these are the skills that you don't have so that's certainly for us as a gtm we certainly haven't cracked the code for whether mm. our curriculum um, we should sort of manipulate and sell and push it all to 18 to 25 year old who right now that and I think it's right I think it's better for them maybe to focus on sort of the um, more immediately marketable skills and credentials that they can put on that so I think that's one GTM even on B2B to B2C I think it's very easy to tie in partnerships but the real and that is a real challenge of edtech I mean there is one about the identity crisis yeah. that the investor community I think has on edtech but I'm guessing we'll get to that and you know I, 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 I'd love to share my thoughts on that but I think one of the biggest challenges at tech is you know, we don't understand that most of us are first generation online learners, all of us right now. And it is a very different way of learning. And you actually have to require almost the meta skills to see how do you learn online. And it's very easy to say. And I think, you know, distribution partnerships give you a sense of uh, vanity to say, oh, I have 200,000 or 300,000 learners at my disposal. And I love them just to make people, you know, begin to learn you know and breaking that inertia requires the highest effort we've seen in all our learner up to 10 to 25 percent actually to the 25 percent mark on on their learning journey where you know those people are able to complete the entire learning journey but that zero to 25 percent needs a lot so um uh, you know one of the things we've said is you you, you have to create that pull as well. And it's not just about access. So I think yeah. on any just access-based GTM saying, you know, access to content is not a strategy that would work. Interestingly, um, on our enterprise learners, and I think we've had the greatest success on engagement, adoption, and outcomes as well on our enterprise learners. And these are learners in the 30 to 45 mm -hmm. age group. And, you know, you talk about, you know, um, who, and I think for the working professional at tech genuinely is really a boon because there is you know we, we when we think about access we think about hey disenfranchised people not having access or whatever i think access goes beyond that someone like me who's a working mother running a company if i have to learn something there's no way that i can leave everything and go and start learning these multiple opportunities which even the nep says multiple entry and exit points yeah. i i really feel that unfortunately not enough of the innovations have happened so much of the focus has been on k12 and test prep in india from an edtech perspective perspective but really where the where the true benefit um and whether without sort of manipulative marketing that you can really make yeah. a difference and think about access in a way of different skills that you need even of the people who are from your tier one but would not otherwise have been able been able to access so i think we are very focused from a gtm perspective on people we don't have to manipulate whatever where you know if they're going to buy a program of 10,000 but have a CTC of 15, 20 lakhs it's a very informed decision that they're willing to take rather than preying on parents emotions which I think is where a lot of the unfortunately a lot of the stigma and a lot of the sometimes often justified uh, brickbats that the edtech uh, industry gets um i think campuses for us have been i think there's a lot our most calibration i think the third point mm -hmm. that i want to make because we were 
we're sort of really scaling back on our efforts on the campus business. Like, you know, um, I think schools and colleges have really gone through the greatest disruption in edtech. And I think it will take a year or so for them to, you know, figure out where the balance lies and which things to introduce. I think just now to get students and faculty back on campus, I think for the next six or nine months, there is going to be a very concerted, determined effort for everybody to be in campus all the time. And I think it's going to be from the next academic. And I think that's important, you know, even as an tech person, I, you, know, you, can't, you can't put your hand on your heart to say, hey, listen, well, nobody ever needs to go to an office at school or a college. That's not true, right? So I think we've said, listen, I think the next, in FY23, for example, let the colleges settle down let them come to an understanding of truly where an edtech comp company or you know online learning companies like ours who are curriculum first right yeah. can come in uh, 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 to add to that rather than just sort of you know in a completely binary way keep saying that for everything edtech is the answer so i think you know that that gtm is you know, that brute force, arrogant GTM, I don't think, um, you know, if you're a true educator at heart, that's the one that you can um, subscribe to. So I think um, the three learnings for us and failures or mistakes or where we've struggled is really understanding what's happening in higher education campuses and where that's going to lie. So we're going to let that be a little bit and take a breather and see how they settle in. I think getting you know trying to over market to 18 to 25 year olds on our courses yeah. like speaking, negotiation influence we're like maybe not let them first get their you know whatever it is that they want and um b2b b2c if you don't have you if you can't break the inertia towards starting to learn and if you don't apply motivation psychology and really create the Pull for learning. Um, I think these sort of these large partnerships um, are often end up disappointing you. So I think those three things from a GTM where um, where again that was worked for us with thirty to forty five year olds in enterprises. I feel like that's the code we've cracked to make them learn and see the benefits of learning. And just one last follow up on that is uh, for these forty five year old. What is the core GTM strategy you are? Uh, that's working for you how are you reaching out to them so i think on that is a completely b2b i think largely oh, yeah. a b2b Got play it. where obviously uh, uh, you know we work with enterprises and um, and obviously we all, I mean, there are also b2c uh, learners who come through that age group but i think it's an enlightened age group who can make a responsible decision for their own them you don't mind you know nudging to buy even from an acquisition perspective or nudging to get them to, you know, complete. Uh, I mean, they're fully formed adults, so I feel like there's much more agency. Um, and I think a fair balance of agency between the learner and the edtech provider, sure. which I think is sometimes not there in, in K-12, just for the nature of the audience as well. And I think many of us might be parents on this call, and, you know, I'm a parent to say it's the easiest uh, audience segment to manipulate. So, so Amit, thanks. So, Amit, uh, uh, comments on the levels which I have mentioned and link to it the strategy. And Shreyasi has obviously laid down things that has worked for her. What has, what as an investor, and again, you know, having an overview of so many startups with you, what are you seeing on the GTM front? What is it that is working, clicking? What are your advice to first budding startups, and then obviously. The mature ones, obviously, they can take their own call. But I think budding startups is where uh, uh, we'll be interested in understanding where should, how should they look at GTM? Yeah, Manish, uh, the way you have defined these levels are very, very interesting. That if you have more money, you can do everything with the customer. Uh, you know, and that's a very interesting thing which we have seen in the last couple of years when some of the education or ed tech companies or even in the fintech companies have been raising yeah. money and you know they have large pools of capital. I think I'll go back to the basics, uh, specifically for all the startups and drawing board. And, and I think the basics is, what is the segment you're focusing on? What is the USP of that segment? What is the price point of that segment? Just go to that basic. What is the, is it a product must to have or a product which is good to have? Unless until you don't get into the basics, uh, you know, you can go to whether it's B2C or it's a B2B, nothing's going to work because even if you go to the B2B channel and classic example would be that a service provider will come to Arshna and say, hey, you know, this is a great product, after school product, 
for you and you are going to get a 20% commission and 40% commission if you put it across your students. The key question which Ashna has to look at is, is it something which is adding value to my kids or my children? Is it something which is adding value to the ecosystem which I have built? Is it adding value to my overall philosophy, right? And that's how every partner thinks. It's not always the money or the commission or the profit you are going to get it, right? So that's how we have to look at it. Again, when we look at it into a customer, we have to look at what is the IP that you have built it? Is it something your strong IP, which you have to ensure that there is no mis-selling happening? And if that is the truth, you are the person. You have to go and sell it. Again, going back to the basics, why the freemium model worked? The freemium model worked yeah. because the price point was extremely low. Or they said, okay, you know what? We've got tons of money. Let people experience it. And once people experience this, there will be an area where we'll start coming out with the pricing, uh, you know, and then people will get used to it and then start paying. It worked well in Zoom. It worked in some of these, you know, areas as well. But let's talk about Coursera, for, for example, right? I yeah. think when it was in the early days I'm, I'm talking about is that when they started the freemium product, everyone enrolled uh, for the product. But what was the engagement? 2%, 3%, yeah. right? Because the value, they didn't value the freemium, even the quality was from the best of the universities, right? I would say no one can complain about it that you are based out of in some X, Y, Z city or even a village in, in India and you are still having the best of professors and teaching you one of the top subjects. But people didn't value this because it was free, right? So I think what is really important out here when you talk, at least when we look at it, is that we really segment and say, is that even if we focus on that segment, is it unit economics over a period of time going to make yeah. sense? If that unit of economics over a period of time is not going to make sense, then whether it's B2C, whether it's B2B or B2BC, it's, it's not really you know going to matter. And that is, is I would suggest most of the startups are the core philosophy to focus on. Uh, finally, for most of the startup, I'll say, hey, you know, whether it's a product, what other service you are creating, you be very clear that is it something you are good to have? Is it something which is must to have? Are you solving a real problem? And finally, focus on what is the outcome. Like when we talk about higher education, when we talk about skills education, I think the outcome is very simple. I need a job. I need a job. I need a job. Or I want to change my career. I want to move from a technology person to an analytics person. That means I want a career shift, career shift, career shift. Hey, I'm at a junior level in the organization. Now I want to move at the manager level. That means I need more manager skills. I need more leadership quality skills and if that's a problem we're solving yes people will move through so i think outcome is really going to be an important factor uh when we look at uh you know and specifically in the education sector great uh thanks amit uh mike uh, uh you've been a, uh you know professor and trainer on entrepreneurship for long uh what are the areas you look at when you uh train people on you know, go-to-market strategies uh, marketing approaches, especially startups uh, related to if you have come across education or you can take example from any startups uh, that comes to your mind. But what are the things people should keep in mind when they're designing their overall marketing approach, uh, given their size? And if there is any interesting take on multiple geographies, that would be welcome. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> go to market strategy. What I tell entrepreneurs is <clears throat> find the one that appeals to you, the one you're most passionate about. Just in this call, I've heard 30, 50, 100 possible opportunities from teaching old people like me to teaching young people. You find your niche and you go for it. And the magic word that I've heard is hybrid. Um, you've got to have a teacher and you've got to have online materials. You cannot get rid of the teachers. Anything we can do to encourage teachers to be more effective in getting the material over, then there's a hybrid approach. All you need to do is teach children to be curious. If they're curious, they'll go and find stuff for themselves. And if there's a scale of some people just love to do everything online. And I have plenty of students like that. They're not really bothered about going to the lecture. They just watch it. They learn it. They internalize it. They get great marks. Others, they want that interaction. Because when I'm at the university, just to cover your international point, I have over 100 nationalities in the room. This is a very sophisticated audience. They speak good English. Many of them, like um, Brenya, come from family businesses. Um, but I insisted with the university that as well as the big show, I do tutorials. No more than six people, half an hour to an hour at a time, so I can understand their particular needs. 
Now, the international thing, there's there's a million opportunities and different cultures will look at things in different ways. So our beer mat entrepreneur may not work go so well in a, in a country, that, well, for example. I remember I did a talk in Tehran. I was the coffee shop entrepreneur on that occasion. But so it's looking for your niche and going for it, producing a hybrid product, which has part live teaching because you can't beat that and part online. But my main uh, message to people who develop education technology materials is very simple please don't make it boring it's got to be engaging it's got to be stuff that people want to watch and the people i speak to about that are the obvious people who know how to make stuff engaging online so it's netflix amazon prime tiktok youtube these people you know by accident or design have worked out how to make things appealing and in in our model you try something quickly and cheaply if it works, great, build it up and you can have a billion pound company. If it doesn't work, back to the pub, get another beer mat out and come up with a better idea. So it's for people like me who understand the face-to-face -face teaching to make sure that is 100%. Then the experts in education technology can take that material and make it applicable to anybody. And this point of, uh, very well made just now about somebody wants to change career. I mean, people often do this every seven years. They want to learn a new skill. They want a new set of stuff. You can get the basics online, and if that works for you, fine, but nothing beats being in front of a human being. And there was a lot of talk about mentoring in the previous panel. I spent half of my time mentoring people one-on-one -on -one for free, of course, to point them in the right direction, to give them the confidence, because our whole approach is, look, this stuff, entrepreneurship, it's not rocket science. Yeah. It's not intellectually hard. It's long hours and hard work, of course. You've got to be prepared for that. But if you have the right attitude, then you just have to be a little bit lucky. But you make your own luck, as I'm sure we all agree. So, I mean, this panel, uh, you know, this is the perfect cross-section of people that I meet. There's the people developing the products. There's people in the schools worrying every day about, are the children getting exactly what they need? There's the investors saying, look, there's opportunities to make money. And what's wrong with that? Which yeah. of the companies do it? And it's all about the teams and the people. So I'm trying to make well-rounded individuals who leave the university maybe with a good degree, that's up to them, but they go back to their home countries, to their family businesses, they go to those places and pass it down. And as I say, when they're all billionaires, which I hope they are, I hope they're going to be sold well, because I'm a bit too old to do it myself, but I can do my bit, which is to create an opportunity using one of the world's best universities to prototype stuff, to get stuff out there, but it's, and I loved it when you were talking about the vernacular. And that, yeah. that is just music to my ears. This is something in people's own culture, in their language that they relate to, given by people like them. You know, I'm an old guy, you know, and people can relate to that because I'm some kind of mentor. But the diversity that is required to do this is almost infinite. I mean, this is the most entrepreneurial time ever, I think. We're coming out of yeah. the COVID. It broke my heart to you know have to cancel lectures because of COVID. We're back. All my entrepreneurs, every one of them says, we're going for it now. We're back. We're we're taking on people. We need the right people with the right you know, skill sets, of course. That's easy to find. It's the attitude, as Simon Sinek says. It's the people with the right at attitude. And I'm there to give them the, the positive, optimistic attitude to go out there and find these ways to market. I can sit in a room and I can brainstorm 20 routes to market for the entrepreneurs in the room. We yeah. can all do that. Then they pick the one that really appeals to them, the one that's going to make the world a better place. Sure. sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think I will jump to Q&A. The two, three questions and we have just five minutes left. Uh, the first question, uh, I think, is from Rachit Sham. And this is about coming three years. Do you see a revival in preschool industry? Arshana, you want to take this question? How are you looking at preschool? What's the question? Uh, just read in the chat window, but I saying he's saying this is uh, COVID was very tough on preschools. Coming three years, do you see a revival in preschool industry? What are your comments? Uh, absolutely, yes. Because uh, I think uh, it's kind of time tested now. So we have not shut the schools completely, right? Like we did not open for preschools per se, but then we did open for a grade 10 or a grade 12 last year for a couple of months, right? So when you see at large in India, we know we are a huge uh, a country with huge population. Uh, the kind of impact COVID had on adults, I don't think it had that much effect on kids. 
and also these past two years i think uh, social skill is something every child is craving for right yeah. and every parent also wants to give that to the child so i definitely think like three years from now definitely it should get back to normal especially for the preschoolers and that's the good way to go because as everyone know content is available everywhere right but as human beings there is more to life than content sure. uh, which <laughs> uh, sure. i think a, a preschooler should not miss out on at all sure. right the sec- yeah the second question is from saurabh uh, raj this is to shreyasi you know uh, the question is with an increase in online course and certification from various upskilling platform mm-hmm. and content provider do panelists feel the need for a certification records management solution in this space for trust and verifiability of these credentials shreyasi uh yes of course uh, i think um, is it an immediate urgent need um i don't think so but i think there are a lot of digital portfolio companies even for students in um high school for example to get all the extra curricular together i mean i think this is all thing about portfolio of work even as employers are now sort of looking for skills and actual um successes that you've had in the workplace and go beyond credentials i think this almost like a personal portfolio of skills learnings credentials projects capstones everything that you would have done um is it uh, is it potentially really interesting idea yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, i just uh, add something small to that which is right my students are paying a lot of money to get a very good degree from a very good university mm-hmm. nothing beats that that's good for employability whatever i have very few qualifications i have a very poor degree in chemical engineering but i kind of made it as an entrepreneur you need both and all my my employers the people that i speak to say all we see are cvs with great yeah. qualifications in there how on earth can we find the right people one of my spots get 75 it's a brilliant company akqa they get 75000 applications every year how can they sift them and they say look do a song do something different whatever so the answer to that is boot camps I'm getting as many of my students into these companies to spend a day meeting the people, trying things out, so people can see them in action, how they work in a team, all the intangible stuff that you can't put on a CV. But the main success factor, or the result factor for most of the people that I speak to, is I'm earning money. I'm self-employed. I've started a company. You measure it not in the qualifications you have. You, you may have those in the past. I'm making a, a living for myself and my family. that's what they want to do and that's why the materials i want to help produce are the ones that help those people achieve that simple goal even if they're just going to be a freelance i don't sure. know content uh, sort of to your next uh, second question i think the response is yes there are a lot of tech solution that are now being part of edtech uh, products uh, right from learning management systems to uh, crm systems to you know student information systems to notification based systems so there are huge amount of partnerships that are happening in the edtech industry and this thing is growing i will just quickly wrap up the panel with my last quick question 30 second response to that question from each panelist which is uh, uh, just one thing you wish to change in the way edtech is evolving which will create huge impact just one thing and we can start with amit just rapid fire 30 seconds response right. so some tangible outcomes uh, you know and add value to your customer or your students or your children or this that's how i look at it shreyasi i agree i think tangible outcomes as much ed as tech in business um, i think it's a different dna to be an educator and entrepreneur i need to recognize that archana one thing um, you want to change yeah if you want a tech to reach across all economic levels i think uh, you should always plan initially to come up with four levels of models like a freemium top down bottom up and sponsored so that you know as a company when you have a sponsor to a tier 3 level then you will have the csr also covered and uh, you will also you know it's one product right but you reach it in different ways so i think that will be a very smart my call um Every time I stand up, I think three things. One is entertain, inform, and be authentic. Yeah, clear what you're doing, why you're doing it. Simple as that. Superb. So we are bang on time. I thanks uh, all the panelists for for a wonderful conversation. I would like to thank all the panelists again, and uh, Manisha to you too.
So thank you to our esteemed speakers for a wonderful and enriching discussion.